You're listening to another episode of Skin Tings. Thank you for following, for rating, for subscribing and recommending. If you haven't done all of that, it only takes a couple of seconds and I'd love you forever. Just like I do Long Fringe, IOM Forte and HC Fisher. Thank you all for listening and for taking the time to leave such nice comments. Now for this episode, I got to speak to the legendary Annie Lennox. We chatted before uh, International Women's Day in early March, and it was every bit as special as I'd hoped. Here she is, Annie Lennox. I'm always fascinated about the next generation and what the kids are doing now, whatever. And, you know, I've been aware of your kids for a long time because they're both so incredible. And when you sing with your daughter, I just love it. You have this shining, like the look of pride when she starts singing. And you look at her like, oh, she's good. She's good. And, <laughs> and it's, it's not in that kind of way of like, oh, you know, my daughter's singing. It. Isn't it lovely? But, if, you know, everyone's just got to tolerate it because she's not that good. But your daughter really has an incredible voice. Um, mm-hmm. Lola has a really great voice. It's rich. It's warm. It's a real talent. And then your other daughter, Tally, the art is off the hook. And, and I don't want to be like a brown nose when I say people, you've got to go and Google uh, Tally Lennox's art because it's really strong, almost this Russian kind of colours and this muted colours, but strong, bold lines. And it's really quite dramatic and amazing. First of all, you to tell me what those two guys, what are they doing next? I mean, have they got big projects coming out? How can people find mm-hmm. out more about them? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. They will be absolutely um, thrilled to hear your beautiful compliments about them. Um, what they're doing next? Well, <clears throat> Lola right now is finishing off her next record that will come out. She's soon to put an EP out for a, of a few songs. And uh, we work together, which is just a thrill. Me and uh, her and Braden Wright, who's her partner, this, we, we've ended up being a bit of a of a trio in a way. It's a Fantastic! Of, it's the best thing that ever happened to me in a lot of respects. In the sense that, you know, she's my daughter and I love her to bits, and I want to be her ally. And I want, you know, without being too um, dominating, I'm I'm sort of enjoying working with her as an equal, like discovering her as a young woman artist and we can put the mother-daughter thing in a way to one side in that relationship. We become a creative team. It's like, it's the sweetest thing for me to experience in that relationship. It's actually quite unusual as well, isn't it? Because a lot of kids, a lot lot of kids are like, I want nothing to do with my parents. I want nothing to do. I want to be my own artist. I'm going to do a completely different style of music. So I I do feel that loveliness coming from that. Lovely. And uh, I mean, you you know, I I always say like, I'm not the momager. No, you're not a helicopter mum. No, 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 no. I'm not. I'm I'm truly not. I, I really give her space and... But we do have a very um, unique relationship, and um, and I cherish that because it's been really important. It's, it's incredibly important to me that I have a great relationship with my daughters, and um, you know that just doesn't happen. It doesn't necessarily happen. I know I didn't have, and, and my mum and dad, you know, we come from another generation, and I yeah. was kind of they felt rebellious, and and I was, you know, in in my own way. And it was difficult because we had a massive thing called the generation gap that was going on. Oh. It, it's less so now. You don't, you don't hear people talking about a generation gap. They came out of the, the Second World War. Life was so much slower then. I mean, oh. so I, I always feel that my, I, I, I feel the same way because I feel that the difference between how my mother grew up and how I grew up is a huge, big deal. But the difference between myself and my nieces, I, I get everything that they're doing. I understand all of it, you know. That's, that's but for my, gen- my, mother, my, my mother's generation, to, to, to see the changes in the world, it's just so much more dramatic. I think it's just so much harder for them. It was. And we didn't also, we didn't have the languaging, you know, about things like, um, well, the, the, the sort of, Everything really, <laughs> emotional intelligence, you know, for example. I yeah, mean, I, I know that I struggled as a young 
uh, teenager, I felt depression. Which teenager, which, tell me about any teenager that doesn't. It's difficult to individuate. It's really hard. You, you can't talk about things with your parents. So, you know, all manner of stuff that we couldn't, I couldn't talk about drugs, couldn't talk about oh. alcohol, couldn't talk about boys, couldn't talk about relationships, didn't talk about anything, actually. Just try to kind of survive. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but survive, but deal with them in a way that they, they could have, they could understand that, but it wasn't really, they weren't getting the full uh, spectrum of who I really was. Right? Mm. Being gay, for example, you couldn't tell your parents you're gay, for example. No way. No, right. do you know, I didn't even hear the word gay till I was uh, 15. Yeah. 15. So, I didn't I mean, know it existed till I was 15. That must yeah. have been for you to process. I mean, I don't know your precise story in that regard. But never, you know, that's what, that's the sort of stuff I'm talking about. Yeah. But I would like to just go back to Tully, if you don't mind, because I want to <laughs> miracle about Tully. My other daughter, Tully, who's yes, a, the artist. Artist. I just wanted to give you a little bit of a, of a, of a. She's interesting, you know. She's a she's a true artist, um, and it's it's a tough road to take because it's it's very very demanding to be an artist I think it's just you the canvas the brushes and the paints and the colors and the shapes and the decisions that you want to take and she's just committed to that she just paints every single day and she's just that's her life she took it on and um you know in this lockdown period it was extraordinary she came to stay with us here and just painted and actually sold her paintings it was so crazy it was like what how is this possible with you know, but that's kind of the, the crazy stuff that happened in lockdown. Where yeah. You sort of had to reimagine yourself. And for me, for and I'm sure you'll identify with this, um, I rediscovered music again for myself, like with my mm. voice. And then thought, oh, I'm such a Luddite, I can't do anything technological. And yet I was able to record myself, get a little light delivered. It was like, okay, what should, because I realized I have a creative nature. It's who I am. I'm a creative person. I'll do something. You just put me in a lockdown situation and with a few books and whatever. I'll manage. I'll be okay as long as I've got the food, obviously, and all of that. I'll... Be, I won't. I will never get bored. Ah, tell me about it. I was. I was think boredom is a privilege. It's kind of like I've. There's not enough time in a day to do the projects that I want to do. You know. I mean, my lockdown has been a voyage of discovery to all of the things I didn't think I could do. Like I, I produced, but I've never engineered. And now I'm engineering and producing myself with the software that I've learned and all the gear. And here I'm surrounded by gear now. And I absolutely love it. And I never thought I was going to be a studio person. Beautiful. I never thought oh. that was, I would always be like, I'm never going to be sitting in the studio 20, 30, 20 hours a day doing. And now it's like, you have to force me to go to bed because I'm so excited yes, by you just get the creative thing. <laughs> I yeah. love that. Right? Oh, congratulations. I love that. <laughs> You're kind of breaking down your own sort of, going ev evolving and pushing your own what you thought were your limitations that's so beautiful you know it's it's fun to actually be the one pressing the buttons and creating and playing with plugins and doing all that kind of stuff have you so you've been doing diy have you got any new skills and have you you've done as well i think my biggest skill is actually just learning how to set up a tripod <laughs> <laughs> a tripod it's like you know when dave and i in the first early uh, days of Eurythmics, we had so little money, you know, and we were trying really aspir as aspiring, way above our station. And we wanted to do things that we thought we didn't, it was ridiculous how as aspirational we were. But we pulled things together and we just, we just it made happened. it. And, and we worked so hard at it. And that was all we thought about. We're single-minded. And in actual fact, I think for an anybody, any artist, anybody, a filmmaker, someone who wants to write uh, novels, books, painters, cooks, chef, whatever it is, you just, you really just have to be obsessed with it, really. Yeah. Just and dive it's, in. It's guaranteed. It's nothing is guaranteed. I mean... I think about the billions of people in the world, and, and, and this is the thing about International Women's Day, I'll just curve back again. I think about girls that get no access to education of any kind, type, that, you know, they're more or less guaranteed to be just kept down for their entire life. And, you know, they'll, they'll probably be married off 
to some man that's decades older than them. Ooh, yeah. Pregnant at the age of like 14. And they'll just sort of have to produce children because there's no choice in that. There's even no contraception available. Even if they have access to it, they wouldn't, they'd be prevented from getting access. And so there you have it. It's just stuck in those... And you know, when, when you're saying that, I'm sure people have images of, you know, some deepest dark place in Africa or India or some other, what they perceive as third world country. But that happened to, that nearly happened to me, you know, a, a Brixton, London girl, okay. because I was seeing a much older guy at 16 years old. And that's what he wanted to do with me. And my way out was education. So it's kind of, you know, I think people also have to remember that this is women and girls everywhere. Everywhere. And next door neighbor. Global <laughs> feminism, global feminism. That's what we need. We need global. Yeah. We have to understand it from a global perspective. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I, I just had to say that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. No, I, I listen. It's, it's wonderful <laughs> to hear you say these words. How has your lockdown been? I mean, I know it's a question everybody's asking at the moment, but I think it's just so interesting to see how different it is for, for so many different types of people and different people. How has it been for you? Mm. Well, as it's a personal question that you're asking me, um, it's been interesting because, you see, I'm really aware of what's going on around me as well. I take a real interest in the world, so I keep... I can't just shut myself away and think nothing's happening. Yeah. I, mean, I guess no one is because this thing has impacted everybody right across the board. So people that have means, you know, we can kind of, I mean, what our means means are being able to access food, being in a secure place, knowing that you've got some kind of safety net system to protect you. But the honest truth is that right at the beginning of this, I think everybody was just feeling like chickens with their heads cut off. <laughs> yeah. You know, that was the feeling like, ah, oh, what now? Is this the end of the world? So it's kind of got to from, is this the end of the world to, I can do this. It's weird. There's an adjustment that's taken place over the last year that um, I find myself, I'm surprised, you know, at how adjusted I've become all this <laughs> right and I guess everybody feels in their own way they've had to adjust and I keep thinking about everybody else because I keep thinking well I'm okay and I, it's, it's good to be okay <laughs> believe me it's good to be okay mm. but that's just me I mean what about all the people that have gone through such upheaval I mean to to start to lose to lose your job to not know when the next little bit of income is going to come in to put food on the table to feed yeah, you. Yeah, exactly. No, this is the thing that really, um, it really affects me. It really affects me thinking about other people. As, as I'm, I'm okay, so that's okay. Like even with the vaccine, I'm, I've been vaccinated. I've been vaccinated. My husband's been vaccinated. We're, we're kind of, we feel good about that. But it's also a strange thing because only a year ago, there was no vaccine. Mm. You know, I'm just like, wow, it didn't take long before this vaccine came. And I'm absolutely pro-vaccine. So that's where I'm coming from. And I'm encouraging everybody to take the vaccine. <laughs> I know. I did it's such a, it's a, I, I can't, I cannot actually comprehend some of the basic arguments I've seen against it. I'm like, you know, when I was at school, we had vaccines for polio. We had vaccines for all kinds of things. This idea, I mean, the vaccine is uh, the, the invention of the vaccine, the protection for the human race, and especially for poorer people and disadvantaged people around the world has been vitally, vitally important. And now I think it's a very kind of almost privileged thing to say that you're not going to take it. It's like you are in a position that you can decide whether or not to take a vaccine. I mean, I've been to places and you've been to places around the world. It's like that is the most vital thing that's holding on to life. It's been able to be protected for it. So I, I get I'm, I get quite a little bit worked up and annoyed about it, too, because I'm also a bit like, yeah, you know, good for you that you feel that you can or cannot take a vaccine. That's nice for you. Great. But actually, a lot of people, if they did not have that, they would literally not survive. Absolutely. And that's the position that I take. And what I've come to realize over this year has been like 
all the controversy, all the different perspectives that have come out so strongly, it has been like quite a learning curve to realize that people can take different positions and that sometimes these positions are absolutely mad and really, truly <laughs> insane. I, I, honey, I hear you. I hear you. That was insane. Wow. But then, you know, and I... My, you know, I'm always a person that's like, well, you're all, everybody's entitled to their view and to their perspective, right? Mm. But when it becomes extremely extreme and dangerous, then I'm like, well, not so much, actually, you know? And this has all come out this year. I mean, I'm living in the United States now. I mean, I'm here too. I'm in New York myself. Ooh. Oh, so but you're in New York. Oh. I'm in New York. So I've been here the whole time. I was in London. Um, and I went to my place in Spain for like a, a couple of months, but I've actually been here since March, based here since March of last year. So it's been very interesting for me too to watch the whole. And you know, we have this um, British American thing. We can see we see things from two perspectives, right? Absolutely. And so you know, I've been coming to the United States since the mid seventies, <laughs> and. Uh, you know, I've been very aware in my own way, in my own way about racism. Yeah. It has been such a painful thing for me. And I'm not saying this to kind of say, oh, I've always been aware of it. But, you know, I've never lived it. How could I? How could I have lived it? I haven't. I never even dreamed to say I fully understand it. But since I was a kid and I became aware, well, of certainly about apartheid, it just undid my head, you know. I was mm. just, so I, I was it, reading all the latest kind of as many as many books as I can, as much information as I can to keep myself current. I've understood that actually I've always been an ally. I've always been an ally in my own way. Okay, so I'm going to make that really, really clear. But I've never, <laughs> since coming to live here, it has impacted me in such a yeah. Way. And I think part very of different, it, isn't it? It's, it's very different. different. Very different. For, it's a different experience as well. Oh, I mean, I, no. it's very wow. different. I, it's, it's, I find it here. My feeling about it is, um, and I love having this conversation with you, I feel that it's just, that they're so much more proud of the racism and they carry it as a kind of, as a very kind of almost like, I'm proud to be this and I'm proud to have these viewpoints and there's no shame to it. I think in England, there's much more, and in Britain, I should say, there's much more thought and you know there's much more awareness of like yeah I know that song that shouldn't be that's 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 not okay that's not okay here it's like hey man we don't care we're just gonna just walk down the street and with our you know confederate flag and just be blatant and call people all kinds of names it's not saying we don't have that element in Britain of course we do yeah. But here it's, I find it's, it's a whole other level. And I think four years of Trump have just made that uh, so much worse. So, Absolutely. so much worse, right? What, I think the thing is that it's the weaponization uh, on top of everything of racism, where you see young kids m running at speed away from, from policemen and those situations that have been time and time again the impact of it had never really hit me as hard as in this last year where I absolutely yeah. realised. The fact that people could be shot in the back, I mean, you know, the gun culture and the right to hand, handle bare arms is something that obviously in, in Britain people have, you know, that's not, that's very different. Mm. And um, Yeah, you're right. The comparative to understand racism, whoa. <laughs> it, is, it, is really, it has really, really deeply disturbed me, actually, to be quite honest with you. For me, I just think a basic thing is that everybody should be happy with their own skin colour. And no one, whatever situation, should make anybody else feel bad about their skin colour. But I think that if you're trying to make certain groups of society feel terrible for their skin colour, then what you're doing is you're just perpetuating the stuff that's happened to you. So I think it's about everybody having that comfort in their own skin and not feeling, you know, feeling equality and feeling very important and feeling grateful and happy in their own skin because 
what we love, what, what I think is really good about the world is you have all of these different colors and races and cultures and it's having respect for everybody else is the, the crux of defeating racism, not pointing fingers and blaming and saying, oh, you're better than you and you're better than that person. And I think that I feel very strongly about that. But listen, <laughs> uh, we, we, we went deep. <laughs> but, you know, I think one of the things I, um, I was going to ask you about your activism, because one of the things I think is really important that I just think we should all remember is um, I have this thing about I've done a lot of activism in my in my past and I still do and it's always about being standing on concrete not quicksand so I think the fact that we are we've had long careers and we've had long successful careers and that's given us a concrete foundation to stand on means that we can hold people up and we can do things in a positive way and we can have strength and we can be very very effective because I've also seen the, um, the the situation where people are they have so many personal issues and Self, that they sink in like it's like they don't stand on concrete they're standing on quicksand and they sink so I think it's a good thing that we're in the solid positions I've been able to hold up very members of my family and my friends because of my situation and I think that's really a good thing it's the people who are standing in stronger situations are the ones that can help the people who are not that's my perspective that I have on it you know yeah. And I really totally and fully endorse that. It's very difficult to be an activist. It's very difficult to put your head up above the parapet if you are sensitive to being shot down, because you will be. Absolutely. They will come at you. They will come at you. You have to be strong. You have to be strong. And you just, yeah, you just simply will crumble if you can't take it. And yeah. you've got to just, you really have to be informed as to how to best protect yourself, how how when to be diplomatic when it's absolutely appropriate to be diplomatic but then again how to speak up when it's not yeah. you, don't, you must say you must absolutely say it so you know yeah you i think uh, there are those of us who are drawn to that and those of us who are not so much <laughs> <laughs> i mean i do think you have a talent for it and i think that's the most important thing is that you're one of those people to me who gets things done um, and I think that it's, a, as you say, it's a very difficult thing to be an activist um, because you are putting yourself in a position to have arrows sh shot at you all of the time. And, and it's because people can't, you know, people have to deal with their own guilt or they have to deal with their own situations. They don't really like it when they see someone doing good because then they just feel bad about themselves. That's not your problem. Um, but how did you get to that point of being who you are in that respect? Did you have a person that you met or a childhood, your parents? or a person you met along, what changed you? What was that catalyst where you became pop singer, huge artist, but at the same time you made this switch to become an activist at the same time? I've been looking back a lot over this last year. Um, obviously, you know, we were talking about earlier about the lockdown and, and another thing it's gave me and many people the opportunity to be reflective and to be introspective, you know, and I've kind of been thinking a, a lot about my past, my upbringing, my journey, how, I came, how things came to be, you know. And um, it, the, the activism part has always kind of been there because, well, it's, in, I, it's part of, it feels like part of my DNA. It feels just like it's in my bloodstream anyway. It feels, yeah. so, it feels just like something that's second nature to me. So I'm not quite sure if even you can define where that comes from. But culturally speaking, and from my family on one side, my father's side of the family, they were all very activist people. With, with a, they, they were very political and, and left, left wing. Mm. So. And yeah. I myself, I mean, sort of, I've never been, I've never joined a political party. I've always felt like let down by politicians. I've always felt that there's just, they have an, a particular agenda. And I, I just have never trusted it really. So I've been, I'm not really apolitical, but I kind of am in a way. I've just kind of thought, well, I was obsessed with music and just really, really wanted to speak my truth and, and, and find myself and evolve and change and yeah. shape shift and become, you know. And really, to be honest, one of, the, one of the real turning points for me was becoming a mother, was becoming a mother. Because right. I, you know, I'd been through so much as a sort of strident, kind of, you know, um, performer, songwriter, all, all these different kind of hats or different uh, manifestations. But when the motherhood came through, uh, first of all, actually, to be quite really personal about it, 
I lost a baby. I lost my first baby. Wow. And wow. it was so traumatic and so life changing. And my whole perception just went, changed in a nanosecond. That loss. Yes. Immense. Yes. And I was just in that trauma and in that kind of, kind of grief and realizing right away, there are millions of other women that have been through this massive loss mothers that have lost babies and it just was yeah. so profound. Yeah. so 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 it's like a complete overnight moment like i can't even i know it's very personal but i think it's important because there's so many women have gone through this and will go through this and it was like a universal experience like every, you know and i could not imagine what it must be like giving yeah. birth in a position where you have no access to uh, health care, you know, and, the, and I was thinking also about the mothers that had died giving birth, I mean, for hundreds and hundreds of years, and that still do, young girls that, um, are, you know, they, they, may, they may not have chosen to, to become pregnant, yeah. and they're maybe yeah. 15, they're very, very young, and they're giving birth in yeah. dangerous circumstances, and I'm thinking, my God, we've all come from a mother, without the mother, going through this nine month pregnancy, going through this delivery, where would men be? And those that do not care about the mother, about the female aspect of life, that do not care, that do not, that do not have, you know, that are violent towards women. Yeah, do don't you feel that there's this kind of, um, it's because they get so disconnected, you know, our society, almost kind of continually is weaving them away from it weave it's not your job it's not whatever you have the power over women but you let's just weave you away from actually staying connected and being close and holding their hand and and feeling what they're feeling um because you're guys you're supposed to just rule and you're supposed to protect you're supposed to do all these things it's yeah yeah it, it really is and it's, it's, it's there's this disconnect that i always feel it's like if you understood really what your wives and your daughters and the women in your life were going through would you really still have that that viewpoint you no, know it would not it's yeah. extremely broken and extremely damaged and you know i'm not a psychoanalyst but i have given a lot of thought about why it is is it nature or is it nurture and you know if you go to places where there is a great deal of gender-based violence against women it's very 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 dark it goes yeah. really deep and um and I think that when young men themselves feel disempowered because of poverty, extreme poverty, chronic poverty, for, for just for one scenario, that uh, there, must, there must be some kind of something that happens culturally of that, in that culture of historical uh, abuse that is, you know, disempowered. And I'm not giving any excuse but I'm trying to understand that. In, in my experience, I mean, I've, I've read about it in my book, so it's also very personal, but it's also, you know, out there. You know, when I, my first boyfriend was abusive towards me, and it was almost this kind of thing, he had a really horrible, he was trained to be a doctor, he had a really horrible boss who was just treating him like absolute rubbish. And it was kind of like, and I was the person that he had control over, so I was the one that got it, do you know what I mean? And I think that it, I see that a lot in the way that's perpetuated. It's like, well, you know, a man's told his house is his castle, so everything in there belongs to him. And it's the only place that some men get to rule. And the only people that they get to rule over are their daughters, are their sons and their wives, you know, and the women in their family. Yeah. And I think that that's a bit of that kind of perpetuation that I see too in, in, in terms of the situations that I've been in, um, that I've had to get myself out of. Mm. But, yeah, I mean, oof. <laughs> Especially International well, Women's Week. It's a, this well, is a conversation I've been having a lot, is, you know. You know, this is wonderful. I'm so glad. I really, really, I hope this doesn't sound patronizing in any way. Not at all, because I'm an older woman. I was like, I'm so glad. I'm so glad. <laughs> but, you know, there's so many conversations that need to be had. There's so much languaging that needs to be had. I've been aware of this for so long and really yearning to have these types of conversations, you know? And it's almost as if something happens, you get a tipping point and somebody says, yes, we have permission now and everybody wants to have conversations. Yes. 
Now, conversations are great. And what we need to take from our conversations is what actions do we take? What lessons are to be learned? What do we actually do with it? You know, and so I'm, I'm loving the podcasts and the conversations. They're just phenomenal. Yeah. And this is what has been, I know this has been missing for decades. And yeah. I know that it needed to happen, but this is the moment when it can. Yeah, absolutely. I uh, 100% agree with you. And I do feel because of those conversations, there's so much more awareness and knowledge that a lot of people just didn't have, they didn't realize. I mean, with Black Lives Matter, I've seen friends of mine be like, like l real proper light bulb moments of connecting the dots. And it's just been a wonderful thing to see. And, and you know, we have wonderful allies like yourself that are really helping connect those dots and, and putting these uh, organizations and these groups together, like your circle mm -hmm. um, thing which has been in, incredible but listen i'm gonna ask you some other stuff as well because I, I know that you um i know you yeah i know, I know you, you don't have lots of time and i mean you can we can just chat about politics we literally i want to talk to you about performance because I think yeah i don't get to talk to many performers that often it's been and the, you know listen i mean we've got to do a series or something like that. <laughs> right oh, good, couldn't we Well, what's been interesting for me on this podcast is that, you know, the, the number one, there's a lot of questions that I feel as artists, we hate being asked. And we're asked them because the presenter or the TV show, they want to get some juicy tidbits. We're in a clickbait society. And I'm kind of like, I'm not asking any of those questions because I hate it. And what we do love to talk about is songs. And we do like to talk about the, the, the history of them, what it moved in us, why we're doing this, why we're doing that music bands fashion and all that kind of stuff and everyone just wants to get a bit of gossip out of it um but I, what i was going to ask you was, mm. it's a tricky road you know writing political songs or songs about things that I, you really feel and believe in true. it's a very tricky rocky kind of road and i was going to ask you about how you talk about that in your songs how do you connect your activism to your songs and and what is one of your favorite ever songs that you've either wrote or love that you feel is very conscious it's a good question. In the 90s, when the Amnesty International Tour started with Tracy Chapman and Sting and Yusun Udur and, and Peter I Gabriel, remember that, yeah. Yeah. Um, I was just blown away by what they were doing. I, I was looking at that combination of music, activism, um, and sending the message out about justice, injustice, human rights, all of that. And I thought, this is, this is the best place where where things actually connect and spark and music has always been that platform as we know yes you know, i realized i'm not really the person to write that very direct anthemic song as much as i would have loved it <laughs> sisters, maybe sisters at the time you know sisters at the time was very deliberate and i thought oh i want to write an anthem for women i want to i want to do this and it came right immediately you, you're so lucky that it happened you know when i do that it can be because <laughs> It was naff as you know. It's just, it's just like you go to like whenever I've wanted to write a song, I thought that I is the cheesiest thing I've ever heard. So you're lucky <laughs> to pick that out of the air. I mean, uh, Beacle by Steve. Uh, yeah, by Phoenix, Nelson Mandela. Yeah, yeah. yeah oh my God. Those are Dylan songs. I mean, oh, Lennon songs. So many, so many, so many. But you cannot just, you know, it's a kind of alchemic process and it just doesn't happen like that. And to it be doesn't. quite honest, I've written so many songs in my lifetime, and yet I can't just sit down still. It's still a mystery to me. I don't know how, I can't fathom it. And I actually have stopped writing for years because if, you know, if it doesn't, if the song doesn't call itself to you, I can't, I know activism actually has taken over, to be quite honest. My speaking voice, I mean, I love to sing and I love singing so many different songs. I still, I sing, 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 every day I sing here where i am right now i, mean, I see your instagram every day i'm like oh she's singing again great you know, it's super fun you know i don't even yeah. have a microphone i'm so luddy it's like it's pathetic but um and i just do it on my iphone and it's just what it is and people can take it or leave it doesn't matter i do it with my heart and soul and that's all that counts but um your question about writing anthems yeah i mean it, you just you just do what you can, don't you? you? Just you sing what you're supposed to sing, what comes to you. Yeah. 
It's finding that kind of unique um, way to write about it, I guess. I think if I can think about the, the most successful songs I've written, I, we had a song called Little Baby Swastika. And I remember I saw this tiny little baby swastika, like like a foot off the wall, little scraggly ones. And in my head, I was like, that looks like a child's done it. Like it's the first attempt at oh some little God. kid. Oh and I remember God. thinking, well, who put little baby swastika on the wall? <laughs> and that became the song and that became the anthem. And I think it, it comes from that. It comes from seeing a little spark of something that takes you in a different direction. Because we're living in an era where all some of those songs have done, it's been done. And it's been done and done and done, right? Right. Everything is a little bit de de derivative. I mean, extremely. It's very difficult, I guess, to become innovative. I mean, people have been. So I just. I'm going to go on a tangent now about innovation and polystyrene. Please. Polystyrene right? flashed into my head, and I thought, yeah. you know, I actually did see her perform at Hornsey Art School. <gasps> with my I actually really did, and I have a memory of it. I, I just, but it's it's just vague, you know. But it's, it's kind of vague about a lot of things. But what the memory is is just seeing this kind of force of nature bouncing across the stage. I mean, like with an it was an energy force. The, and, and she was wearing like you remember she used to wear a yeah. tin hat like a World War yeah. One tin yeah. hat and she had like a plastic bag as a dress and she had like and but it was just this power and I'd never seen I've never seen anything like it at the time mm. and I didn't quite know how I mean it was like like what you know, like what was this radical everything was she was totally unique and. It's, and I'm saying this because you, you mentioned that everything is sort of like so derivative, but I use the word derivative, but everything is like so repetitious now, but you don't so much, it has been a while. I know that energy is out there somewhere and there's someone doing something that will take us all into something else mm. because that's just the way it goes. It's just calm. Absolutely. It goes, you know, but I was thinking like, wow, she really, really was an Ari up. Remember? Yes, that? of course. Yeah, yeah. From the slits. Mm. Another one. Another like a, a like a like These a punky flag. girls. Yeah. <laughs> She's like a meteorite. They were like so so like they burned bright. These women, these young women, burned bright, and they they went too soon. I mean, in my opinion, it's something yeah. to do with the energy. I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. Obviously, um, it's a slightly lockdown question because, I mean, obviously things have changed. What, what's the one thing that you think has changed that you are happy not to go back to? Yes, I'm happy not to be too distracted by all the distractions that can take me out into the world. I'm a shy person and I feel very uncomfortable in situations where I have to be talking with people that are very superficial. I get, I, I just read it. I'm, I'm, I'm like a kind of antenna when I go out. I really mm. feel everything. It's like I've got these antenna. I can tell how people's energy, I read them. Mm. And it, it wears me out. I don't like being in rooms holding a glass of wine, talking kind of shop. I don't, I don't like it. I, just, oh, I'm, I I'm, cannot I'm, bear it myself. I, I refuse to go to, I don't do after parties. I refuse to go to, I've like, I've done, I've sung and that's it. <laughs> you know, and I'm not going anywhere now. I mean, I might have a couple of my really good friends in my room playing songs, you know, after a gig to kind of wind down. But yeah, it's, it can be, it can be quite exhausting actually. Um, that, there's that. I mean, not to say, see, I've always thought I want to be, fame is a really weird thing and celebrity is even weirder because there was never like this thing about celebrity. It started in the nineties, as far as I can see. And I realized like, I'm not a celebrity. I mean, I find it so offensive. I'm not a celebrity. I'm a musician. <laughs> I'm an artist. I'm a performer. I'm a writer. I'm many, many things. And some people would put that label on me, but it's like the most devalued thing. It's the most diminutive thing that anybody could put on me is that I'm a celebrity. I just find that almost demeaning. And, yeah. uh, and I won't accept it. You know, I don't like it. That currency, I won't play it. I hate red carpets. I mean, they really, and I've done, and, and, oh, woe is me, poor me that I've had <laughs> red carpet. But I'm telling no, but they're you. Not, they're not, I mean, people think, they're, people think these things 
problems are fun. I'm, I'm going to just join you there and be the kind of like, you know, first class problems. But people think they're fun. They're actually not a lot of fun, these things. They really are. It's like you have to get an outfit, get your makeup together. It's a lot of work. And then you do it for two minutes. Yeah. It's all over. It's like, oh, God. Yeah. yeah. Clearly, then, you and I are both have some, this thing in common that we are introverts. We are introverts because you see, for some people, they love it. Like they're, they're, they're swimming in like, that's it. They want the adulation. They want the attention. They want all of it. They want to show off because there are extreme extroverts and usually borderline narcissists kind of, yeah, <laughs> way beyond narcissistic, you know, all of that, all of that. So, yeah. I mean, it's something I had to learn how to do. But I, you know, you're talking about how shy you are. I remember the first time I met you, and I remember that about you. Because it was for Pavarotti and Friends. And um, with uh, George Michael, and it was for the Dalai Lama. In Bologna, you were there. In Bologna, yeah, I was there. And we performed as well, yeah. And I remember we came down and there was a separate room for all of us, you know, um, you know, I, I artists and people were performing at the show. I remember when I walked in and you were like, had your back against the wall, you had a cup of coffee, you were sitting in a kind of corner. And I kind of looked at you and I said, hello, hello. And you kind of, had the most beautiful smile, you had a great, you always look very stylish. And I'm thinking, oh yeah, she's shy too. She is not loving this <laughs> at all. You um, know, I, I've always, and it's sometimes people in the past, and I've, 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 se I've seen this, like people in the past, when I was, very, I was far more defensive than I am now. I'm not the same person as I was even then. My kids were very little and they were there with me. Well, they weren't that little. They were kind of like in the 12 and 10 or something. And they were with me at that. And, but, you know, they came with me on that uh, trip. Yeah. And, um, and so I was kind of having to be a mom and be a performer. And it's a completely different <laughs> thing. Um, <laughs> It's, it's something energetic backstage as well. Like, I'm not going to be out there hanging out with people because, it, first of all, you know, if you're performing, you, you've got the voice and you just need to protect it. And so, yeah. I, I, you know, and you have to sit around for hours. And you, uh, for me, I was always like, I have to stay in my dressing room. I'm not going to go out there. And it's not standoffishness as much as it was be, I need to be protective of my energy. I need to be protective of myself. And I mean, yeah. if, if it was just hanging out and just maybe just. I, I learned that the hard. I, I learned that the hard way. I learned that the hard way by kind of like feeling I had to be the lead singer and I had to do this and I had to entertain everybody and blah blah. And after a while, I was just kind right. of like, actually, I need to go back into the. Um, I need to go back to the tour bus and I need a cup of um, warm something and I need to just chill out and not talk mm -hmm. and not speak again until the next day. Um, because, and you don't learn that until you lose your voice a couple of times and That's then right. you're like, okay, yeah. Okay. I mean, I came from, um, you know, a, a, a little town called Brixton, so I had no examples. I just had to learn all this stuff the hard way myself. <laughs> how would you know? I mean, you know, how yeah. would you know? It wasn't. No, you just, you just you have, have to work to it out. It. You have to learn yeah. it. And the thing is that people, in the, you know, you know that bit where, where suddenly, uh, let's just say, you have a record that just takes off and everybody wants oh. to talk to you so as the singer you're doing everything all the time I mean there was a time in my life and it took about a decade um, when I was me and Dave when we were together we were doing interviews doing making videos doing performances travel you know you've done it we've all been there if we've been yeah. there and yeah. only, you, only, you only understand it if you've been there yeah, hundred percent, and it's it's like nothing that you would ever believe. I was liking it to when we had had that first smash big hit that we had. I was liking it to. I felt like I was on a steam train going full steam down a mountain, and I was hanging on to the back of it for dear life. I was just just hanging on, literally just hanging on. Uh, and there were wonderful moments that happened, you know, I, uh, I was going to ask you about your, your, your moment in your life that you were just like, how did I get here? There were lots of I wonderful relate. things that happened, but, <laughs> but it was also kind of like, it flashed by and it was crazy, especially, I mean, I don't know how artists deal with it now and having social media, because we did it in a time when there was no oh, social media. Yeah, you I'm know, so it's... grateful that I'm not there now. I mean, I, do, I don't want to be there. It's just, it's, it's so carnivorous 
<laughs> you know what I mean? It's yeah. just social it's media is a whole thing. A whole, whole other up. thing. I mean, you know, you've heard that. You've heard that. I'm sure you know that thing, like where they said, you know, that if you have your photograph taken, it's like part of your soul. So, well. Yes, that's right. Right. And there's something in that. There's something about just taking you and just taking too much and the violation that it is when you don't ask permission, when you just take something, it's like steal. I feel it like, Oh, I'll just steal this from you now. Yeah. And that's why I hated paparazzi. I hated it because, mm. you know, I mean, I'd, I, okay, fair enough. I'd asked for it to a certain degree, but I never knew it could be that invasive. And I just felt it was violating, especially when I had two children and I thought, early 90s when I had my daughter Lola and I went out one day and I was pushing her in the buggy and I went down the front path to the gate and opened the gate and went out and I saw a massive lens pointed at me just in front of me and I turned to the right and I saw another one pointing at Oof, me yeah and you feel so protective when you're a mother yeah I said, okay right and I just turned right around shut the gate went right back yeah up. I have I I have I have my little rules. And you probably have them too. I have my little rules. Um, I mean, I don't want this to turn into like two two big artists talking about how hard it is. No, but no, I just no, but no. I have I, I do I do have my rules. I have my I like if I'm in the shower, I'm not getting out the bathroom to to pick up a call. If the phone rings or whatever, it stays ringing. And number two, if I'm at if I'm at lunch or dinner at a table, I'm not getting up until it's finished. So I'm not signing anything, taking photos, or whatever, it's, it, until it's finished. And my third one is if I'm holding on to a child or whether I'm, I'm with a child, I do nothing. I say no to everything because I am, you cannot let go of that, hand, that child's hand to sign something or take a photo. You, you're, in, you're looking after a little thing um, and that's in your care. And I think that, and those are my three, those are my three rules. And then I've learned how to deal with the rest of it. So the rest of it's okay now. I'm fine. You know, I can be in a room and I can charm people. I can do all that kind of stuff. But those are my three rules that I keep, I keep a hold on to. It's like, if I'm looking onto a child, I'm not letting go. Beautiful, beautiful. For anybody that's listening to this, we are not complaining about this. It's just recognizing that you need to learn how to be. And it is a big, big lesson. And I'm yeah. grateful so many things because do you know i'm a better person in so many ways for it because i've been asked about so many aspects of my life and i've had to learn how best to respond you know i've had to learn how to deal with people the best way so i don't i don't want to hurt people's feelings i but you know maybe they're invading me and i need to learn how graciously to kind of put the boundary around and say actually i'm really busy right now whatever it is and that is what you and i have in common that we could speak for hours about and you know and people don't know about it, but they yeah. never used it right yeah it's it's uh, it's you know it's, it's just good and bad so, you know i think that on the whole i would say um i'm happy to have had a career where i'm still earning my main kind of living and everything i'm doing is like i created a world of music around myself and that's what i love doing and that's yeah. what i do every day i wake up and i'm still doing music and i'm still i'm I don't, i'm directing my my life and my career and i'm the one that decides my calendar and all that kind of stuff so um i mean i think that's a massive plus I'm going to let you go in a minute, but you know, oh, I, I have to, I have to tell you, you <laughs> I wrote a song called that. I have to tell you, I'm going to see a friend after I've got a, um, a lunch date here in New York. I can't see it this time. I have to see it this time because I've got to interview Annie Lennox. And he said, oh, tell her I said hello. And I said, oh, really? Did you work? He goes, know. yeah, you know. He goes, yeah, I did. Yeah, you know, I produced um, Diva and Medusa. It's Maris to Freeze. Mar is a really good friend of mine. <laughs> and he said, Oh, you just. I'm going to go and have lunch with him in a minute. Come yeah, I'm going to go have lunch with Maris now. So he said to say to you, Oh my God, tell her I send a big kiss. He said, he said I remember her daughters when they were born. Yes, you so would. I just want to say, I I want to send you some love for Maris. Oh, yes. that's, thank you. He, you know, he's so incredibly gifted. Wow. Right? <sighs> and so. I met him. Back in the day with Bjork, and then he did some stuff with Skunk and Nancy and did some stuff on my solo album. We've been friends since the, you know, 90s. Oh, God so bless. I just... I love him. He's a gentle, gentle man. 
and he's bright and he's insightful. And it's just, I'm, I feel, you know, there've been so many people that have come through my life and we've had moments, right? We've, you say you've been friends with him for a long time. I haven't seen Marius in decades, but you know, that, those moments when you have that opportunity to work together, it's very precious. Oh. Yeah, we're going to make techno together because we both love techno. Oh, <laughs> yeah, he's like that. He's always got his finger on the bus. For, for our audience, Master Feast is a very well-respected um, very producer. Well respected. He's done lots of very big movies like Moulin Rouge. He's done the music for that and, and some Incredible. movies. And so it's nice that we have a common, a common friend there. He's just a young guy in his 20s when we met. And he was completely kind of, he was just kind of, People start to get a little bit interested in him, but not nothing like the way that he. I mean, he's grown exponentially. It's fantastic. Yeah, I've, I've been I've been I down to life. some of his um, when he's been recording. I was living in LA for a while, and he was recording at um, the big studio there, beginning with B. Is it? But anyway, and so I just go. I'd go when there's a recording an orchestra. I'd just go and sit in the back of the room and listen when he was recording an orchestra for his movies. Oh, so fun! How sublime! How sublime! What an experience! <laughs> well, listen, I'm going to let you go because right, I well, realise that um, I've been well, chatting well, for double the amount of time that we're supposed to. That's great. And I, before I forget, I didn't get a chance because I wanted right off the bat to say thank you to you because you've just been you've just been so so remarkably available and kind and thoughtful and generous oh. giving us your time <laughs> no 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 it's really i so ge genuinely want to thank you for getting involved with the circle thank you very now. much we are so appreciative it's hard you know when i'm in the asking position it's hard to put yourself there i hate asking anybody for anything <laughs> yeah. sometimes do it i have to go on the other side you know so, and uh, so thank you. Listen, it's been an absolute deep, deep pleasure for me to speak to you today. I um, love your active and you're like a shining light of how to do it and how to do it well. You have a talent oh, for it. And I think the world is a better place for having an artist like you grace its beautiful service. Thank you know, so, so much. Thank I just so want much. to say that to you and um, and just have the rest of a beautiful day and say hello to uh, Tali and Loa. I've never I met will. them. But, I will. I um, will. They will be delighted. And I'm thrilled. very, I'm astounded oh, how talented you. those two kids are. That's down thank to, they love down to you, you, so you too, right? <laughs> we try. <laughs> we try, <laughs> yeah. Bye, my love. Bye. Right. Bye. Bye. Love, love to you. Bye. We could have spoken for hours. That was the incredible Annie Leos there. Don't forget there's loads more episodes of Skin Tints to catch up on. Joan Armour Trading, Paul Weller, Debbie Harry, they're all on there. But if you're up to date, great job, Gold Star. Let me tease you with my next guest. It's multi-brick award winning Rag and Bone Man. See you then. Mm -hmm.